psychologist behind and they were conversing with a psychologist, but it was not true. Okay. So, and then this, this uh, micro worlds this artificial is very simple situation consisting of blocks of different shapes and sizes and colors and there were three different versions. One was something related to vision developed by Sussman and others and this was an actual real thing which was built which would take these blocks based on some commands and it can move things around. And the third one was uh, block movement planning this was based on natural languages. So, it, it interacted with uh, some kind of a natural language commands and in the 80s there was this popularity of the so called expert system. So, by that time people were kind of got disillusioned about the wide capability of AI that cognition whatever the human being does the machine can do uh, they got disillusioned because human being is very more, more much much more complex. So, it can do many many things human may much faster and more accurately it has its own capabilities, but it even today it cannot uh, you know do a simple thing which a 5 year old kid does. Uh, like you know tell a story and find out what uh, the moral of the story is. Okay. Now, these expert systems in the 80s they became very very popular and uh, they were very very um, highly uh, worked in uh, narrow domains and the domain knowledge was kind of built into them and then they worked based on rules and they solved many problems and they used. Um, uh, so, the, the, the knowledge of the experts codified and using rules to find out the answers to some situations. So, some examples were there was a program called dendral. So, this identified compounds based on spectrometer readings. So, this worked at the level of a PhD in chemistry and there was another program called mycin. So, this diagnosed infectious blood diseases again they said this works on the level of competency of an MD in pathology and so on. And then there was this XCON developed by uh, Carnegie Mellon for uh, Digital uh, Equipment Corporation. And then in the 80s there was this big funding by the Japanese government and uh, many of these private industries uh, it is called the fifth generation computer uh, uh, project. And so, this actually it did not take off very well, but there were many other it gave impetus to many other areas. Okay. And in the 90s uh, th one of the landmark things was uh, the uh, development and showcasing of Deep Blue, the first chess playing computer which defeated the reigning world champion Gary Kasparov. And then, uh, so there was also this uh, work on what are called as intelligent agents. Uh, and just to give you a few more details of uh, uh, Deep Blue, uh, it had two, it could uh, compute about 200 million positions per second. And then, um, uh, and, and, and so on you can you can read some of these things, but then there was another one it is a seemingly simpler one, but it is very powerful it was called deep fritz and then it defeated uh, Vladimir Kramnik uh, with a 4 to win again in the game of chess and then this was actually programmed on a personal computer and then um, having a very very highly specialized program. So, it is a combination of hardware capability and some software mathematical techniques put together. And in the 2000s, so we had uh, many many things that we are very popular today like autonomous driving vehicles and so on and so forth they started much much earlier. So, in 2005 uh, Stanford robot won a DARPA grand challenge it drove autonomously 131 miles along uh, an unrehearsed desert trail. So, it did not uh, tip off or you know it did not fall off or anything like. So, and then in uh, 2 years later in 2007. A uh, team from uh, Carnegie Mellon won uh, again a uh, uh, DARPA urban challenge. So, this one autonomously navigated 55 miles in an urban environment. So, uh, it kind of adhered to the traffic rules, it did not hit anybody, and then that was a success one. And then Watson, IBM's question answering system. So, it defeated uh, two of the greatest uh, Jeopardy uh, winners that was in uh, 2011. Uh, so, and later in again in the 2000s when I say 2000s until today. So, this is it. So, there are many algorithms which are developed by AI researchers over the years parts of that were kind of infused into many of the things that we already use in many of the systems and like data mining, uh, industrial robots, logistics, speech recognition, vision, banking software, medical diagnosis and so on in some limited ways. Okay. And then this Watson q and system just to give you a feel of uh, some details. Um, so, it had access to 200 million pages of structured and unstructured content and it had 28000 processor cores and 16 terabytes of RAM. 
and so on. Okay, so it has again the point I'm trying to make is it uses a lot of brute force as well as some very very clever techniques. So a combination of those two could achieve those interesting things. Okay, so just to match the wits of a human being. Uh, and now this being put into practical use. So several nurses use it for consultation for uh, in the in the field of medicine. Basically, it's used in Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Okay, so. And uh, DeepMind is the most recent one. So, DeepMind Technologies is actually a British company which was bought over by the parent company of Google Alphabet. And so, they developed something on AlphaGo. So, that be the human professional player uh, called uh, Go. So, Go they say is uh, as co complex or a little more than chess in terms of strategy. And uh, so, that was an extremely surprising thing for them because they never imagined that a machine could match the wits of the greatest Go player. And then, uh, okay, so I don't know something happened here. Um, then they have another program called Alpha Zero. Uh, then they played against the programs playing Go. So it was not machine versus uh, person; it was machine against machine. Okay, so and then it learned on the Go, and then it improved the moves and so on. And then, um, so th this is the um, uh, status. Um, a, a few samples uh, that I have given you. So, many of the facets of AI over the years to summarize so playing games of strategy and natural language processing and understanding. So, language translation, speech processing and understanding, vision. So, when people started uh, the speech processing for example, as an instance. So, it was very ambitious, but now the complete speech processing may not be there, but some of the essence of that is already incorporated in any products. When you call your any kind of call center or anything, your insurance, uh, airlines, banking, uh, it just goes to this kind of an automated uh, answering system, which uh, it uh, tells you in a natural uh, language, uh, tell me what you need. You say, uh, you press keeps on picking 0, you say, no, tell me, I can understand, uh, you know, it speaks your and then it is very um, context dependent, it does a very good job. So, uh, theory improving, expert systems, machine learning and many, many, many others. And then some of the broad features of the nature is it senses something, it analyzes something, it learns something pretty much like what human beings do and it thinks and it responds at least thinks thinking in the not in the sense of what we feel what thinking is, but it appears to think and does the job. And the broader AI today is like this, it is not really about intelligence, because we do not know what thinking is, we do not know what learning is, we do not know what intelligence is, we have not understood it ourselves completely. But, so we can think of that as automated intelligence, where you automate some kind of manual cognitive or routine non routine task. It could be assisted intelligence, where you help people perform tasks faster and better in some sense and augmented intelligence, helping people to make better decisions and it could be autonomous intelligence automating certain decision making processes without human intervention. So, these are all have been incorporated in some form of the other at some level or other in many many of the products. Okay. So, the then and now of AI. So, earlier thinking about requirements of AI to become a reality. So, they thought that there was a new paradigm required, there was new thinking required and new model of computation, new set of algorithms, this is all fine, it is still there. But now, suddenly because of this growth of big data, so that changed the course of this one. So, say river is flowing and then you put a big boulder, what happens and it ch changes course, something like that. So, they did not see so much money was poured in, nothing much happened, because ultimately they want to see some results which is practical and useful to the society. So, now this growth of big data, so many, many things happened and now uh, lots of example data is available, adequate computing power is available. And then you can derive algorithms from data, which is basically machine learning. Okay. So, the course has changed. So, looking at huge patterns of data uh, and come on coming up with a model is uh, machine learning. Okay. So, I am going to skip over many of these slides, because I am going to go over um, um, Ah, okay. So, let me go over this very, very briefly. Some of the sample tasks performed by algorithms seemingly uh, exhibiting some kind of intelligent behavior. Okay. So, underlying these things they are all algorithms. Okay. Now, Google news, there is no human intervention, it is completely automated, it gets data from news from several different fields and then it gives you this news. Okay. So, it is automatically compiled and there is also there are some um, 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 news generating algorithms. So, there are some algorithms which get these uh, news feeds from 
uh, several company performance data, their quarterly reports and stock uh, uh, market data and so on and they generate news items for some of these newspapers. Okay? So, that is there and then your movie making and then autopilot in these aircraft. So, many of these things they make decisions based on what we said earlier senses and putting them together coming making decisions and so on. And uh, again, so many tasks which are considered to require human intelligence several years ago maybe 10, 15 years ago are now routinely done uh, by these algorithms. And one simple example is complex travel itinerary. So, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you had to go to a travel agent if you are doing this multi city. Even online, about, uh, about 5, 7, about 5 to 7 years ago, multi city travel itinerary was not possible. Uh, so, you uh, it is because based on my personal experience, you had to go to a travel agent. So, this complex travel itineraries, you can just do it online. And so, lots of things have matured. And what used to be called artificial intelligence, many of these things put into the products which are routinely used these days, they are not artificial intelligence anymore. So, until that time they were, but once they get infused into these products, they become part of the product. Okay. So, language translation, the, as I gave an example earlier. So, natural language understanding, computer vision, many of these things, self driving vehicles, this is a very big, big initiative. Okay. So, now, uh, oh, no, let us skip over this one. So, talking about automation. So, I just covered a brief history of um, AI and then automation is completely different than AI. So, AI can help in automation of certain tasks. Okay. So, automation is totally different. So, automation has been a human quest for millennia uh, ever since known civilization. So, we want to minimize our effort. So, that is the very objective of automation. Right? So, we have to minimize our effort in doing anything. So, we want to have some kind of a mechanical thing to ease our tasks. So, now this is one example that I have observed. Now, um, so these suitcases were known and you can see in these movies people carried their goods uh, from 18th, 19th century. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 5 minutes? Uh, sure, okay. Uh, and then um, wheels were used in chariots for over 3000 BC uh, at that time. Um, so, nobody said we can see people carrying suitcases and you can have these porters carrying on their heads even in uh, 20th early 20th century. So, so, when somebody tried to put these two things together then there was this kind of real automation right of, of sorts. So, there are plenty plenty of these examples. Okay. So, now uh, these autonomous vehicles, the self driving cars, there are so many 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 initiatives okay. and the self driving trucks. Uh, and there is also this Boeing self driving taxi which was demonstrated um, very very recently. Okay. So, there was no pilot it just took off flew around and uh, came down and they want to have this kind of a automated flying taxi service. Okay. And um, so, AI at work, uh, so healthcare you can support uh, diagnosis by, so th there was actually a recent work which was showcased it is from uh, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. So, these researchers they have developed an algorithm which goes through these radiological data and detects some finer uh, things which human radiologist expert they cannot detect those things. So, that gives them a heads up on, on um, the, the detecting the diagnosis and prognosis of diseases. Okay. Financial services, transportation and logistics, technology media. So, I got already a, a warning shot there. So, let me try to wrap it up. Um, and then uh, retail and customer. So, these are all pretty standard package things that you see in the news every other day. And so, one other thing um, I just want to go into details just about two examples. So, there is actually an online um, insurance company they used an AI bot to automate claims processing from the beginning to end, end to end. And generally it takes days or in some cases it takes months for the so called insurance adjuster to see what has gone on to verify there is no fraud and then process all that and get you the uh, money. At, uh, so, now the, the claim. So, now this board is able to complete the entire pipeline in about 3 seconds. And so, guess what happens? It saves several weeks of pay and reduction of manpower. So, again, this is going to affect the jobs. So, these adjusters are going to be replaced by bots, but it is not that simple as I am saying, but it is going to affect in, in some way or the other. And 
Uh, the second one is the um, shop, grocery shopping. So now there are already two stores in uh, at least two stores that I know of, in, which is in the news in Seattle. The Amazon has opened these stores. It's completely automated. So you have to uh, uh, register. You have to give your credit card, debit card, whatever. Just go into the uh, store, uh, pick up the things in your cart, just walk out. So you don't. Have, so everything is done by these cameras. It monitors and then it get debited. Okay. So now they want to put it on a larger scale. And then now the other thing is many of these grocery stores they are rolling out uh, home deliveries. So guess what happens? People don't like to drive, and then uh, they don't want to stand in the line. So you just send your um, uh, shopping list, and then it's going to be uh, fulfilled, and then uh, going to be delivered. Now who is going to do that? Now today human beings, but tomorrow it's very easy for the you know robots to go and do it, package it, and then send it in an autonomous vehicle. Okay, so two rings means done or three rings, two rings. So three rings is completely cut off, right? Ah, okay, okay, okay. All right, I got it. Okay, we started late. Thank you so much. And uh, so these are some of the uh, details. Okay, now um, let me just give you, madam. Let me. I want to just give them just two slides. Okay, two slides, and then I'll just jump to the conclusions. Now in US, the five biggest how AI can really help. So it's not like develop some solutions looking for problems. Look at the problem and go from there then develop the solution. So, I am just give you maybe one or two examples and then I will be done. So, there are five major causes of death in US. I have already given the three not in that order. So, first one is heart disease, second one is cancer, the fifth one is stroke. Can anybody guess what the third one is? It is cause third largest cause of death in US, it is medical error. So, 250,000 deaths per year due to uh, some kind of wrong diagnosis, wrong medications, wrong dosage and so on. So, third largest cause of death and so this based on Johns Hopkins study and the fourth largest cause of death in the US traffic accidents this many over 135,000 deaths per year. Okay, now, put AI to work. So, how can you do that? I will just give you two slides and then I will jump to the conclusions. Because the two rings, I, I got too stressed out, and uh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay, so uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me have a sip of water. So because I rushed through this uh, so much, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am breathing easily now. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't transfer my stress on to you, but uh, anyway, so. This one is for a social cause, like looking at a problem, giving the solution, okay, not the other way. Now, how do you do this medical error? Okay, let, let me tell the how you can put AI to work for the fourth problem, fourth largest cause of death, the other problem. One simple, simply put in uh, two words autonomous vehicles. So, when vehicle to vehicle, if they communicate with all these sensors and so on, everything is safe. Of course, provided of course, we make assumptions the sensors are uh, safe and the algorithms are good and there are no errors, reliability and so on everything taken into account. But when you mix human beings and automation together that is a problem. Okay. So, recently you know uh, if robots if all robotic uh, operations fine, robot and humans if you mix there is a problem because they are in different wavelengths. Recently there is a patent, there is a product from Amazon it is about smart vest or smart jacket which people in the shop floor wear. It has a lot of sensors because there have been a lot of accidents with robot human interactions. So, he tries to grab something, something falls off and then robot hits. So, so this senses the movement of the robot, robot knows the human being is close by. So, it either changes course, goes back whatever. So, the smart jacket. Okay, now, coming back. Uh, so, you can use AI in the form of autonomous vehicles to reduce accidents. Okay, now, the the for the largest cause, the third largest cause of death in US, which is medical error, I am going to give you an example. So, filling prescriptions, so I said that it could be like wrong diagnosis, wrong medication, wrong dosage, three major subclasses. Now, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, they opened a pharmacy in 2011. It was completely, it was staffed by a single robot. That robot was manufactured by a Swiss firm called uh, Swiss Log. Uh, it is a 15 million dollar robot. Now, these robot receives information uh, from messages from doctor's office and pharmacy, it, it gets fed. 
and then it works with all the information about the patient, the condition, the allergies, other medications, checks for complex and com uh, uh, complications due to uh, some other interactions, and it gets updated drug information and uh, from pharmaceutical companies. So it keeps itself up to date. And uh, if there is anything which is uh, you know conflicting, it immediately gives an alarm. It has failed two million. This is as of last year. It's a little dated. Okay, so as of last year when I did this. It has failed 2 million prescriptions without making a single mistake. Now, compare this to the data from the American Pharmacists Association, the average error rate at pharmacies is 1.7 percent and 3.7 billion prescriptions are filled annually in the US. Now, you can do the simple arithmetic. So, 1.7 percent of 3.7 billion is 63 million prescriptions. So, that many errors are there. Okay, so, it is and there have been some deaths as well and some lawsuits. Okay, so, you can have this is an example of automated prescription filling, but of course, it is capital intensive. Okay. Now, uh, how we can so, our societal needs have changed over the years. So, whatever was there 20 years ago like this terrorism and uh, pollution, uh, so many things societal problems were not there. So, we have to put AI to work in those areas. So, big problem it is draining many of the tremendous resources and resulting loss of lives this so called social evil called terrorism. And then so, proactively make use of data and improved models to eliminate prevent detect some of these threats and then design public places to be safe. There, these are huge projects can start from student projects and go on to uh, 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 ventures. So, these are very interesting stuff um, and then the other one last one put AI to work to harness the exponential growth of some of these capabilities in computing, communication and storage. So, there have been we have been seeing exponential growth. So, Moore's law it doubles every 18 months or 24 months. So, <coughs> it is unimaginable. Uh, so, whatever computing power you have you develop here today it is much more than whatever you had all these years in the, in the past. So, that is the power of doubling. And with this one, but the human population grows only kind of linearly or sublinearly. So, this one, um, so essentially you have exponential per capita growth in computational power, storage, communication bandwidth and content generated. Okay. Now, um, so there are numerous problems. Now, the question is can it sustain, can you keep on doubling, so now car production, can you can't keep doubling car production. You can't keep on doubling the, uh, um, the the dress or any other cell phones. You, no other product, but computational power, storage capacity, transmission bandwidth, content. It's just doubling. You know, every 18 months to two, 24 months. Can it sustain? Can these industries one day they say people enough is enough? We don't want more. That's not going to happen for a couple of simple reasons. One is there are numerous problems which require lot of computational power. And there are problems believe it or not even today to get the optimal solution it takes the computer which is the size of the universe and the time to compute the solution is more than the age of the universe. So, there are many many problems seemingly simple looking problems, but I am talking about the optimal solution. So, we do not have them we do not have the algorithm the so called computationally hard problems are intractable problems and then we have approximation algorithms and so we have been living with okay with whatever is available but if we get more we can use more so that's the that's the point here and so AI and automation uh, employ or deploy to make use of these enormous uh, resources and growth uh, to derive something meaningful and uh, beneficial okay uh, so there's i want to just mention this i read this report so we have been talking about big data big data big data companies making of big data so that's good that's a reality data is being generated there's exponential growth no question about that but now the question is are companies getting any benefit out of that now we see because i was so surprised to look at this report we say oh it's everything is dandy everything is fine these companies are making lot of money using big data but it's not true there is a lot of hype now this Believe it or not, many companies have not seen the payoff from their big data investment. This is not from me, it is from PwC report. Now, learning curve was steep, that these are some of the reasons, and tools were immature, there is considerable organizational challenges. So, the only hope is AI because it is 
not possible for traditional algorithms and human beings to do that. So, something like machine learning. So, data the traditional data analytics see data analytics use these core statistical techniques as the skeleton, but we need something more that was the lesson. Okay. Now, th this is again from that report this was a question posed to what extent do you agree with the statement that you utilize all the data that you capture to drive the business value for many of these different verticals. Now, public sector only 43, power and utilities 37 percent, automotive only 33 percent and the most surprising thing believe it or not is hospitality and leisure. They thought oh there is so much of data you can drive this business it is only 13 percent. Okay? Now, um, so, many many other areas are about harnessing the potential of AI. Now, we still have a long way to go I am going to put out about two or three very simple like toy kid examples which I have seen uh, I, I am very observant I am like a child I look at everything if something is not okay I just pick on that and uh, you know um, document it and use it somewhere. Now, this one is actually from Google news. So, remember earlier I said Google news is all automated there is no human intervention it gets news feeds from many different sources it compiles and then gives out this news. So, there was a news item here you postal service misidentified statue of liberty uh, in stamp it is in a 3.5 million message. So, what it means is the following. So, what US postal service did was they released a new stamp having the statue of liberty uh, picture here. Okay. Now, it so happens that this picture somebody identified is not the picture of the statue of liberty in the in reality not the picture of the statue. See in Las Vegas there is a hotel it is called New York New York. So, in front of New York New York there is a statue of liberty it is a replica. So, US postal service used the picture of the they got it from of the web. So, that picture was the picture of statue of liberty in front of New York New York hotel in Las Vegas. So, somebody managed to find that how based on the features not for, we can't do it we can, it's for, 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 for a common man it is not visible, but and this 3.5 million mistake was the lawyer for that company is this suit US postal service because you have used our image our the image of our uh, thing. So, ok. So, that was one news item and then other news item in Google news is totally selfish woman who climbed statue of liberty. So, there was also an incident about the same time one lady climbed up the statue of liberty. So, a lot of these um, you know law enforcement other safety. So, they had to bring her down. So, it took lot of public resources and money, So, but Google news does not know the difference it took the keyword statue of liberty and then it was there is a lot of news here. So, it gets that and then this one was also in the news gets that and puts them in the same category although they are totally unrelated. So, AI has a lot of lot to learn still long way to go. Okay. So, the classification is, is a big problem. Okay. You might have seen I uh, will tell you a couple of other big problems and then I will conclude. So, this is an email I sent out to my students in the class. So, quiz 1 whatever work on it and send it back and suddenly that email system tells me getting too much email from this person you can unsubscribe that was me I sent it. So, it is sending me hey are you getting too much emails from you, you see the point right. Okay. So, it is still a long way to go and then recently um, if you uh, have followed the news uh, IBM released uh, 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 say corpus of 1 million uh, faces because earlier there was a study made they said uh, by these MIT researchers there was an almost 35 percent error rate in identifying faces. So, there was a skewness. So, there was a I 35 error rate while identifying darker skin females and less than 1 percent error rate for identifying lighter skin males. So, there is a kind of bias there. So, which means that there were more light skin male pictures at one end and very few dark skin female pictures on the other side. Okay. So, this was uh, and then so, IBM released a trove containing over 1 million pages 1 million images of uh, faces taken from uh, Flickr database and then so, they uh, also annotated this hopefully getting rid of the, those uh, or minimizing those uh, error rates in facial recognition. Okay. Coming back to jobs landscape. So, I please do not mistake me I am using uh, his generous uh, offer of going slow or uh, I am not going slow I am trying to wrap it up this is the last topic yeah yeah I am done. Uh, so, 
okay, so there is population growth, there is technology growth, how is going to, so there is new jobs going to be created, there is retaining and reskilling required and um, uh, jobs are going to be eliminated and so on. So, I am going to give you just one um, slide and then I will be done. Um, so, no matter what even in AI, so this is going to the pattern. So, you have all this research innovation a small segment of uh, the working population involved in that area and then product design manufacturing remains. So, this is going to be the pyramid. So, that is going to remain, but how much what numbers that is going to differ. Uh, and there is also uh, many factors which affect the disappearing of jobs, the diminishing of jobs uh, and so on. However, the comforting news is this is by a report by end of 2019 AI will this is actually a kind of very very counterintuitive. Uh, the Gartner's prediction says that by 2019 end of 2019 AI will be creating more jobs than uh, it is taking away. So, it they say 1.8 million jobs will be lost to automation manufacturing and so on, but it does not say about service jobs, but it is going to create 2.2 million jobs. You know if you if you notice historically you know this traditional manual telephone exchange all the jobs were gone, but this electronic automated exchanges controlled by software they created new jobs and new hardware. So, it is going to be a flux of things, but eventually there may be lot of jobs lost, but you have to have that is why for the students you have to be dynamic you have to create have new skill sets again for the educational institutions you have to be very very agile and dynamic in identifying what is relevant and so on. Okay. So, I am really done. So, in conclusion uh, um, you know technology new technology it can be overly ambitious hyped or underestimated and A has gone through many many different phases and uh, A really augments automation. So, uh, I am just going to skip this one. So, the most profound technologies I am just going to quote the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves in the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. And I believe many of these things which AI has started many years ago like vision, speech recognition and so on they have got themselves into many of the products like your call center automated front end and Google search uses many of these things. So, on Facebook, Facebook so they have now they are not called AI anymore they have become part of the product routinely used. So, thank you so much for uh, your understanding and uh, Thank you for being generous uh, in allowing me to go a little over time. Thank you. However, we do not have much time for questions, but how the session was so interesting and so practical. If in the audience, if anybody has any query, any question. Well, we can take it offline if time is a constraint. No worries, we have one minute. You are so quick in responding, we guess. Yeah, I mean uh, now uh, there is always confusion between machine learning and AI and uh, machine learning any problem is uh, formulated in a st standard way with in terms of classification, clustering and all that. So, similarly can we say you know the way a particular problem is modeled. So, that is a AI problem and the way it is modeled differently is a machine learning problem can we say that. Yeah, there is as I said there is going to be a fuzzy boundary as I said many things which are classic there is no like AI non AI. So, AI becomes non AI when the technology matures and gets fused into some of these certain use products. So, same thing with the modeling and other mechanisms as well. Okay, I have a very short uh, question uh, at the beginning you say that AI and AI and automation yeah. are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to me, they are very much related to each other. So, what's your view on that? Okay. See, many of these automation they may not have intelligence. I will give you many of the automation they may not have intelligence. So the you don't have the, that's a misnomer. So they don't have intelligence. It's mechanically done, but it eases your process. It eases the burden. That's automation. So, using levers and pulleys, now Archimedes did automation. What did he do? He can lift a very large, he can give me a long uh, rod and a lever, I will lift the. No, 
I agree with that's what you say. Ultimately, it's automation. Okay. So. That's automation. Yeah. To me, automation need intelligence. That's no, my view. It was not in the library, not in the police. Because there was no software. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Now, I would like to call Professor Ajay Rana, sir, to step forward, and uh, Dr. Charu Jain to come forward to felicitate our Professor Subramaniam. Now we would like to continue with our next session. Our next session topic is sounds, sound source separation using spatio-temporal sound pressure distribution image and machine learning. For this we have our chair of the session is Valeria Pasucci is the in inaugural John R. Parks Indoor Chair of the University of Utah and the founding director of the Center for Extreme Data Management Analysis and Visualization of the University of Utah. Valerio is also a faculty of the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, a professor of the School of Computing, University of Utah, and a laboratory fellow of PNNL and a visiting professor in KAUST. Before joining the University of Utah, Valerio was the data analysis group leader of the Center for Applied Scientific Computing at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory at an adjunct professor of computer science of the University of California, Davis. Valerio's research areas include big data management and analytics, progressive multi-resolution techniques in scientific visualization, discrete topology, geometric compression, computer graphics, computational geometry, geometric programming, and solid modeling. Valerio is the co-author of more than 200 refereed journal and conference papers, and is an associate editor of the IEEE transactions on visualization and computer graphics. I would like to invite sir to chair this session. Please welcome. And please introduce our speaker of the day. Uh, so then welcome to okay. this session. It's my honor to introduce uh, uh, Kenji Ozawa. Uh, he received a PhD in electrical communication from the Tokyo University in Japan. Uh, he is a currently a professor uh, of the graduate faculty of the interdisciplinary center uh, University of Yamanashi in Japan also. And he's interested in research including uh, psychoacoustics, uh, signal processing, audio signals, and affective information processing. He recently received the best paper awards from the IEEE conference on general consumer electronics and the IEIC IAS award. And uh, Professor Ozawa is also on the board of directors of the Acoustical Society in Japan. So I would like to wink, uh, welcome Professor Ozawa and give this uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my greatest pleasure uh, to have been given this opportunity of uh, delivering a lecture here today uh, in the fantastic city of Dubai. Yes. Um, I'm fr uh, from Yamanashi, Japan. Yamanashi is famous for Mount Fuji, that is the highest and the most beautiful mountain in Japan. Uh, it is approved as a World Heritage Site, so uh, many foreign tourists visit there. 
if you have a chance to come to Japan, why don't you visit Mount Fuji and Yamanashi? So today, I'd like to talk about sound source separation using machine learning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to demonstrate the effectiveness of our system. Uh, suppose the situation that there are two competing speakers, and one is in front of you and speaking. Welcome to Japan. I'm sorry, too loud. I'd like to try again. Welcome to Japan. And the other is in the direction of 30 degrees and talking. Hello, hello. If, uh, if, uh, your demand is listening to the person in front of you. And if you listen to them with your ears, hello, welcome to Japan. Hello. You can't distinguish them. It's a little bit too loud, so. Uh, uh, if you use a conventional system, Hello. welcome to Japan. Hello. Mm, the male voice is somewhat suppressed, but it's not good with our system. Welcome to Japan. The male voice uh, was removed, and our system can extract the male voice uh, too, like this. Hello. Hello. This situation is called that two sound sources are separated. So in my presentation, I'd like to uh, mention our motivation first, and then uh, our system is proposed, and the, uh, next we are going to, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the effects of system parameters on the directivity. Then uh, our system performance is evaluated, and finally I will make a brief summary. So let's get started from our motivation. A microphone array, microphone array is a collection of microphones operating concurrently for certain signal processing purposes. It is useful in many applications. For example, it, it can extract a target voice in a noisy environment. It allows to a robot to locate and track sound sources. And uh, recording of three-dimensional sound fields is essential for advanced telecommunication systems. But in general, a high-performance system requires a long array with a large number of microphones and high calculation cost. However, it should be compact uh, in consumer use, uh, such like the user interface of a car, navig car navigation system. So our motivation is simple. We want to construct a high performance system using a short array with a small number of microphones and low calculation cost. Mm, before introducing our system, uh, I'd like to mention about uh, two conventional systems. One is delay and uh, one is so-called delay and sum array. In this system, a number of microphones are arranged on a straight line, and vertical direction to the line is defined as zero degree. A target signal comes from the target direction, and uh, oh, sorry, and target signal comes from zero degree, and uh, noise signal comes from another direction. Uh, the target signal arrives at all microphones exactly at the same time, so all microphone outputs contain the signal S. On the other hand, noise arrives microphones with delays, so the noise signals are somewhat different among the microphones. In this system, the microphone outputs are simply summed up and divided by the number of microphones. As a result, the signal S is restored, and the noise is uh, cancelled out to some extent. This figure shows the effectiveness of the system. Uh, the ordinate is direction of arrival of noise, 
the abscissa is direction of arrival noise, and ordinate is noise suppression amount. Uh, zero, when it comes from zero, this, uh, zero degree, uh, no suppression is achieved because it is a uh, target signal. So, uh, this figure shows when the array length is 10 meter, the more the microphones are used, the better the performance is. It's the nature of microphone array. Even when, the, uh, even when five micro, 500 microphones are used, uh, if the array length is short, there is no suppression. So, let's listen to uh, some sounds. The target is. Thank you very much. And noise is. Welcome to Japan. Without processing. Welcome to Japan. Much. How about this? Thank you very much. It's clearly uh, listened to the target sound only. How about this? Welcome Thank you very Japan. much. Not so good. How about this? Welcome Thank you very much. No effect. So uh, it means that this system is valid only when uh, the array is long and many, many microphones are used. Uh, the other conventional system is uh, the CSCC method. Uh, the situation is the same as that of the uh, delay and sound. But uh, this system uh, operates in uh, frequency domain. So uh, it means we need to, uh, we need uh, Fourier transform and the, the inverse transform uh, before and after the processing, uh, respectively. Uh, anyway, uh, this system, uh, in this system, sure. oh. the spectrum of the the spe spectrum of the uh, target is estimated by uh, solving this equation. And uh, this equation should be solved for every frequency component, uh, thus uh, the calculation cost is high. Moreover, uh, estimation usually, usually contains uh, errors, thus uh, the target's estimated target signal is distorted. Let's listen to it. Thank you very much. Yes, the noise was removed, but the target is di uh, distorted. So I'd like to shift to proposal of our system. Uh, the advantages of the proposed systems are as follows. It is compact with low calculation cost and uh, the target signal is distortion free. This figure shows the block diagram of the system, but it's a little too complicated, so I'd like to break down it. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to explain, uh, explain by step by step, step by step in the following slides. First, I'd like to uh, explain the overview of the system. Uh, the situation is the same as that of the conventional systems, namely the target signal comes from zero degree and a noise comes from another direction. Uh, thus, uh, all microphone outputs contain S in common. In our system, uh, these microphone uh, constructs a differential type array, uh, it means uh, one of the microphone is uh, called a reference microphone, and others are called sensor microphones. The output of the reference microphone is subtracted from the output of sensor microphones uh, to obtain differential signals. It is the point. Uh, these differential uh, signals do not contain the target signal. By using these differential signals, we can estimate the noise signal at the uh, difference microphone. And estimated noise signal is subtracted from the microphone, uh, difference microphone output. As a result, the uh, target is destroyed. Um, the target comes from this line, so it is distortion free. 
Oh, I'd like to explain in the, uh, the input part in the next slide. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to explain the idea of spatiotemporal sound pressure distribution image. As you may know, the output of a microphone is a temporal sequence of instantaneous sound pressure re instant pressures. This sequence is converted into a sequence of luminance with one pixel width. This sequence is uh, produced for every uh, microphone and arranged in parallel to form a spatial temporal sound pressure distribution image. Uh, it is uh, abbreviated, abbreviated as uh, STSPT image hereafter. Uh, you can see a slant of stripes. Uh, it is, uh, the reason is why, uh, the reason why is that uh, a sound uh, arrives at the microphone array, uh, it arrives at uh, microphones with delays. So uh, the delay arrives at, uh, uh, the delay is displayed as a slant stripes. Mm, this figure is an example of the STSP, STSPD image uh, captured by 51 microphones in the, in the situation that the target signal of vowel uh, comes from zero degree and the noise signal arrives, at, uh, arrives from uh, 60 degree. Uh, you can see the vertical lines of target signal and aslant stripes of uh, noise signal. And this image is observed at this part in the block diagram. As mentioned earlier, the output of the reference microphone is subtracted from sensor outputs. And uh, the dif uh, differential STSPD image is obtained here. Uh, in this case, the center microphone was used as the reference microphone. Uh, this differential image is uh, this differential image is uh, constituted of n times w pixels. N is uh, the number of sensor microphones, and w is the number of temporal points in a segment of a sound. And this differential signal is fed into a neural network and uh, the waveform of noise at reference microphone uh, with the length of W is estimated. Uh, in, in, in other words, this neural network was trained in advance uh, to record the neural, uh, the noise, noise waveform based on the differential STSPD image. And the estimated noise waveform is subtracted from the uh, reference microphone output. And finally, we have the restored signal, the restored target and uh, estimated noise signal. Uh, sound sources are separated here. So uh, I'd like to shift to effects of system parameters on the directivity. Uh, we conducted computer simulation experiments to examine uh, these effects. First, I'd like to uh, explain common conditions in the experiments. Uh, I'd like to touch on training of the neural network, which is uh, implemented Python library uh, China version 4. The training was conducted using a bubble noise. Uh, it is also called a march token noise. It sounds like this. It was synthesized by superimposing 60 token speeches. And uh, the DOA of the signal, uh, the noise was changed. Uh, where, um, it was uh, fed into a time, uh, the system from various directions. And 
the neural networks was trained to record the noise waveform based on the differential STSPD image uh, with backpropagation method and optimization algorithm of ADAM. And evaluation was conducted using uh, 120 speech signals. Uh, it consisted of 10 words uh, for 12 speakers. And each test signal was regarded as a noise, uh, noise and fed into the system from various uh, directions. The measure was the directivity, that is, noise suppression levels as a function of the direction of arrival. Uh, because the target signal is uh, preserved in our system, the noise suppression level is regarded as the sound, uh, source, sound source separation performance. The hyperparameters should be determined uh, before the uh, testing. And uh, we did some experiments to uh, determine them. First, we uh, fix the sampling frequency to 16 kilohertz, and the interval of the microphone is automatically determined to the two centimeter by the spatial sampling theorem. And uh, other parameters should be uh, determined uh, through some experiments. I'd, uh, I'd like to skip these uh, experiments. And finally, we uh, decided uh, these parameters as uh, shown in this table. Uh, the microphone array length is 16 centimeter. So using these uh, parameters, uh, we uh, evaluated the system performance. The system performance was, uh, uh, this is the directivity of the microphone, uh, microphone array, when the bubble noise is uh, fed into the system. Uh, if the, the array is used as a delay and some array, almost no effect is observed. But with our system, uh, the noise suppression reaches about 20 decibel. Uh, it's almost uh, perfect. Uh, when these are used as signals, fed uh, uh, bubble noise. It means that uh, generalization was achieved. However, when a music is used as a noise, a piece of music is used as a noise, uh, the performance isn't good. So I'd like to check the sound. Uh, first, welcome to Japan. Uh, on the noises. Hello, hello. Before processing. Welcome hello. to Japan. Hello. So. It is clearly separated. Oh, so in summary, uh, constructed a sound separation system using machine learning. Do we have any question? We can take one or two questions quickly. Thank, Thank you, you so much. There are no questions. Uh, so stay here because we would like to felicitate. For this, I would like to call Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Deepak Kumar to please step forward. I'm chair of the session. Please step forward. Thank you, audience. Uh, now we can move to room number G07 for the brainstorming sessions. And thank you for the day. Very good day. Thank you. We have brainstorming session in G07. I see. Okay.